Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's session on pioneering our understanding of the human brain. It is my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Juan Barcia. Dr. Barcia is an MD-PhD whose research has focused on new indications in stereotactic radiosurgery and the search for surgical treatment for drug-resistant neurological diseases, in particular in intracerebral infusion of anticonvulsive drugs, neurostimulation, and cell therapy applied to neurological diseases. His research projects include the regeneration of the nigrostriatal pathway with biomaterials in Parkinson's disease models, the use of biomaterials for the repair of the cerebral cortex, the definition of targets for brain stimulation using brain connectomics, and the induction of brain plasticity. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Marcia is a professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery, Hospital Clinico San Carlos and Universidad Complutense de Madrid. Dr. Barcia's talk is titled Inducing Cortical Plasticity by Brain Stimulation and Prehabilitation. My name is Dr. Roshan Akashamian, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. We would like to extend our special thanks to the Brain Initiative Program Directors, and in particular, Dr. James Nat, for their efforts in organizing today's session. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located at the far left of your screen and type your questions in the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. The presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Juan Barcia. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, I'm going to talk about how to induce cortical plasticity by brain stimulation and prehabilitation in order to treat brain tumors. And this is a first fact I want to show you, and it is that the survival curves of a brain tumors are strongly dependent on the extent of resection. For the very uh, aggressive uh, gliomas, uh, it is important to take away the most of the tumor. A complete resection is uh, critical, but in low-grade tumors, a complete resection can be equivalent to creation. But the problem is that these tumors are very infiltrative. They, it is very difficult to tell where the tumor ends and where the normal brain begins. And it is not like in other surgeries in, in the body, for example, in abdominal surgery, uh, surgeons can take away the tumor and then cut the gut in uh, pieces and send uh, the pieces to the pathologist and the, until the pathologist says, there's no more tumor. But in the case of the brain, if we try to make an extended resection of a tumor, for example, the one you have in the picture, we would have a problems with movement, we would have a hemiparesia, contralateral hemiparesia, and we would have an aphasia because we are going to mm, damage the cortical spinal tract and the arcuate fasciculus. But what if we could take away the functions which are around the tumor to um, improve, to uh, make a bigger resection? So we are going to talk about plasticity. And plasticity was uh, first uh, pointed out by Santiago Ramón y Cajal, who was a, a Spanish a neuroscientist who observed that neurons can uh, increase their contacts because he saw that uh, the, 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 <clears throat> that the uh, differences between the weight in children and in, adult, in adults uh, were caused not because neurons uh, divided, but because neurons increased their connections. 
But uh, Paul Broca uh, showed us that there are uh, certain areas in the brain which are critical for speech protection, and this is the, um, the, the you see in the picture the areas he described as the Broca's um, a, um, a area, which is uh, he said important for a motor language, and. Uh, Carl Wernicke described a similar area, but uh, for the uh, understanding, for the uh, reception of language. And later, Walter Penfield made a map of the cortex while well, he did a, his a, epilepsy surgery procedures. And it seemed that everything in the brain, in the cortex, is well organized, but it seemed also that everything is fixed, that all the locations are there forever. But uh, some authors like uh, Michael Merthenik in, in Animals, he saw that a, a, study, a study which is the representation of the auditory um, functions in the cortex, he, he was able to, to, to show that these representations can change with experience. And uh, this uh, field has been also a, a research by Alvaro Pascual Leone and other authors. But they, uh, Alvaro particularly did a, an experiment which is very interesting uh, for the things that we are going to talk. Uh, if you see in the, in the panel B in the middle, uh, he uh, used uh, he uh, took a normal volunteers who had never played piano, and he measured the cortical representation of the fingers uh, before they started to take lessons of piano, practicing piano. And he saw in the first week at the beginning that the representation was a uh, small, uh, in the, the one it is in the, in the picture. But after five days of practicing the representation grew a, like a 10 times. And they were sent home to rest during the weekend. And they, um, when he measured again the representation, it had shrinked back to the same um, in size as the, as the beginning of uh, the first week. And after one week of practicing, it grew again. And then he saw that it shrank, it grew, it shrank, it grew, but at the end of the fifth week, he saw that the so-called Monday effect was greater and greater, and the Friday effect was a lesser and lesser. So he um, concluded that there was some kind of stable stabilization of plasticity in a very um, short time. So a um, which is the limit? How can we do to change a plasticity? A plasticity, of course, daily, but big changes in plasticity don't occur because we, our brain is very reluctant to change because of learning. And it goes to a minimal states of energy. But a, it would be possible to change uh, this state of uh, lower consumption of uh, energy, of minimal energy, if we push this state to a, to a peak, and then uh, by any means, like uh, inhibition, uh, as I'm going to show you, and uh, we um, are able to make some, um, to, to put some factors which, which make the system go to a, another state of minimal energy. And this happens naturally with the low-grade tumors. It was shown a, in this a paper that a, tumors which are operated a, in, a, which are close to eloquent areas and are operated a, awake, with the patient awake, a, when there is some eloquent function within the tumor, this tumor is left, and after some years, when the when the patient is reoperated, then the location of this function has shifted. In some way, a, the tumor has shifted, 
has uh, pushed the cortical localization of the function away to an adjacent area or even to contralateral areas. So we wondered if it could be possible to take advantage of this principle <coughs> to go faster than what the tumor does. Uh, would it be possible to artificially induce plastic changes in, in, in cortical, uh, in the representation of eloquent functions to obtain a better possibility uh, to um, make greater uh, removal of tumors? And this was a, our, face, uh, our first case was a 28-year-old uh, man who had this tumor. Um, it is the area which is whitish in the, um, in the um, left lower uh, frontal um, gyrus. And this uh, picture shows also the representation of a speech function because uh, it is uh, obtained through a functional uh, magnetic resonance. So uh, this patient had been operated some years ago, five years ago, and a, only a biopsy could be taken. He was under a, um, treatment with radiotherapy and chemotherapy, but he no longer tolerated uh, chemotherapy because of a, a bone marrow aplasia. So um, we operated the patient awake, and um, we only could take the area which is shown in the picture. The tags which are numbered are areas which are uh, active uh, with function. When we stimulate, we can uh, produce the speech of arrest or other effects on language function. So we cannot take these areas away because they are critical to produce, to produce speech. So uh, we put a, a grid over the, um, the, the cortex uh, around the tumor and over the, the re remainder of the tumor, uh, this grid is the one which is typically used in, in surgery for epilepsy to, to find a epileptic areas and a, in a chronic basis. So uh, we uh, closed the, the craniotomy and uh, the wires were coming out uh, through the skin. And after um, one week, we did a mapping, we did a stimulation again of these uh, areas of the cortex using an external stimulation. And in yellow, you can see areas which are still holding a um, speech function. So uh, the tumor was filled uh, of uh, areas which were critical for speech. So we started to inhibit these uh, contacts using an external stimulator with very high frequency the stimulation. So every day we calculated which is the threshold to produce a speech arrest, and we lowered this uh, voltage to produce only a very mild uh, dysarthria uh, while the patient was continually, continuously doing speech therapy. And we could observe that every day we could uh, rise the threshold um, so that the patient rec um, recovered this uh, speech uh, function and he was able to do speech therapy again and again until we, until we reached in which there was no longer deficit. So the Broca's area, the so-called Broca's area was uh, inhibited completely, but he could produce speech normally. And we did a functional MR, and you remember that the a, the um, active area was in the in the left side, which is in the right side of the slide because of the radiological convention. And uh, when we reached this uh, situation, we did a control functional MR, and we saw that the right hemisphere was um, holding the uh, cortical function, the eloquent function, and it was longer no longer represented in the left side. And a you know that the functional MR can have a false, false a positives and negatives, but when we re-operated the patient awake, we could observe that these areas which were uh, previously active were no longer active. 
So a, we could perform a almost a complete a removal of the tumor, and a, we a, used this a, a um, this a, um, a procedure to operate a series of five cases. This is the uh, table, the, the data of the cases. The cases are uh, a little bit, uh, the series is uh, heterogeneous, but uh, in all cases, there was a tumor which was um, holding inside an eloquent area, and we did the same procedure for uh, every case. So um, this was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery, um, the, three years ago, and the general procedure is like you see in the slide. We operate first the patient uh, using the standard uh, criteria. We make a cortical mapping, ma a mapping with, with the patient awake, and we take only areas which are not eloquent. Then we uh, perform this so-called rehabilitation procedure, and after the procedure, we operate the patient again using the same criteria. And every time we reoperated the patient, we, we, we could take more and more tumor. So a, this is the summary of our cases. In, in red, you see areas which are active uh, before the procedure. In yellow, you see areas which are no longer active after the procedure. You here can see the statistical differences when we analyze the functional MR in a for in this case a bird generation a speech production so you see that there is a shift in the uh, location of the um, uh, of the uh, areas which are active during uh, a speech uh, production and this is what happens before a um, surgery into the to the um, left a the next a picture is after the first surgery, we can take only a very small amount of tumor after the second surgery and some uh, three months after the second surgery. This is another case in which um, we could, uh, it was a very extensive tumor and this is the statistical differences and the effect of the overall procedure with a very extensive resection of the uh, right uh, of the sorry of the left uh, frontal lobe. This is a case of a tumor located in vertices area for speech uh, reception, speech uh, uh, recognition, and this is the um, statistical differences. This is the procedure before after first surgery and uh, after the second surgery. So the the, the uh, complete removal. And a, this is a case located in the primary motor area. A, in this case, a, the function a, was not held by the contralateral uh, hemisphere, but it was relocated a, around in, in adjacent areas. A, and this is the a, overall view of the resection procedure. And this is the last case in which a consisted of a big a frontal tumor with a speech and motor functions, and this is the overall procedure. So a, what we can do is to improve the a extent of resection, and a, in this first series, a, we could a, make the final residual volume less than three milliliters, which is a criteria for which a malignization in low grade tumor can start to happen. So we could uh, improve resection, improve uh, survival, maintaining uh, eloquent functions. But the main complications were a infection, a long hospital stay, and uh, the time to stabilize new speech uh, or a uh, modern networks. And this was because patients have to be with external stimulations for a long time. So our next step will be to use implanted generators connected to grids so cutaneously to uh, improve 
this uh, function. Uh, it ha this uh, procedure has been repeated in other hospitals, for example, for, uh, to take a epileptic focus in Wernicke's area. And probably the next steps will be to use this procedure to improve brain machine uh, interfaces in rehabilitation for a stroke, for example. And we have to see which is the limit of our procedure because probably it will depend on the physical networks which are holding uh, brain functions. Uh, thank you very much. This is my hospital and I invite you to come whenever you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barcia, for this excellent presentation on your singular work in cerebral brain plasticity. As a reminder, our speaker will be following up any questions on his presentation by email. Coming up next, please join us as Helen Bronte Stewart presents her landmark work in Parkinson's disease. Her talk is entitled Closed Loop Deep Brain Stimulation in Parkinson's Disease Using Patient-Specific Biomarkers and Therapeutic Window.